Hello, my name is Filiberto Amati and I'm a partner at Amati and Associates in Warsaw. Uh, I'm here today with my partner in crime, Marco Bevolo. Uh, welcome, Marco. Uh, for the second episode of our series on the future of events. Today, our esteemed guest is uh, Mrs. Rieko Shofu, who is director, group CEO of POCA in Singapore and managing director of Sapporo Group Food in Tokyo, Japan. Welcome, uh, uh, Rieko. So thank you, uh, Fioberto Marco, uh, for having me today. So I'm uh, Rieko, uh, living in Singapore, uh, and uh, I'm served as a director and the group CEO of Puka, uh, which is a beverage company uh, dealing in uh, the RTD uh, tea and other the juice, coffee, the beverages. So uh, we're dealing in not only Singapore, but also uh, 60 countries. Uh, from Singapore, Malaysia, and uh, Indonesia. So that's the part of my uh, career. I also have a several position in uh, Japan, uh, which is the, uh, the, the managing director of the Sapporo Group Foods, uh, which is the intermediate the holding the company under Sapporo Holdings, uh, which has uh, several business units such as the coffee chain, or also the global uh, the business, and also some the food business. Uh, that's the second one. And also I have my own company, uh, which I founded 2014 after I uh, left the former uh, the consulting company. Uh, the name is uh, Sensing Asia, uh, which is a marketing and a business consultancy uh, for the company uh, to enter into or uh, to aim to uh, expand their business in Asia. So that's me, and I'm very looking forward to uh, have a uh, meaningful dialogue with you today. Thank you so very much. So uh, from your uh, perspective uh, uh, of leadership, uh, uh, what have you seen uh, permanently changing uh, uh, in terms of the macro views on uh, business events, uh, corporate communications, uh, conferences, affairs, uh, uh, really the, 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 the big picture from uh, a, an helicopter view that uh, your uh, leadership roles uh, uh, give you the opportunity to, to have. So, uh, Marco, you were asking uh, the, you know, permanent, uh, you know, uh, permanent change uh, in uh, events uh, triggered by COVID-19, right? Yeah, correct. Yes, so um, I think that 2020 is a very thought-provoking year. So we have seen many, many changes, uh, but in particular, uh, speaking of the events, the corporate events and the social leadership or networking, and also the macro uh, economic point of view, I think what changed permanently uh, is that our you know, people's perspective uh, towards a live event and then online event. So uh, under the border closure, and also the mobility uh, restriction, uh, some event and the conference transferred to the uh, online platform, right? Uh, so um, such as the webinar, web, webinars or digital event. So take uh, CES, the consumer uh, electronic show example. So this year, the CES 2021, it's fully digital, you know, first ever fully digital uh, tech events. Mm -hmm. Uh, with uh, more than 2,000 that the participant company unveiled their technology. So CS yeah. used to be the live event uh, take place in Las Vegas or uh, the Spain uh, that the many uh, show their latest technology, cutting edge technology uh, on their booth or uh, you know panel discussion, but this year fully digital. And then many said it's successfully done. So that is a textbook example how the you know big show or big event are uh, transferred to the uh, the online platform, uh, but also uh, there are some cannot be done online, uh, which is you know uh, which requires a physical interaction or uh, the the physical sampling like food show. Yeah. So the many food show have been cancelled last year or scaled down. So uh, that's the, uh, the one of the, the example uh, which cannot be done uh, fully online. Yeah. So this uh, February, 
uh, there was the, uh, the food show uh, named Gao Food, uh, host take, took place in uh, uh, the UAE. So this is an annual event, uh, the, the worldwide the food show event. But this year, although uh, they scaled down the event, but they decided to uh, host the event physically. So what happened mm -hmm. is that uh, they are prohibited to, um, you know, um, to gather uh, and uh, mingle together. And then the very strict uh, safe distancing measure uh, took in place, has been taken in place. Also, they discouraged to change the business card. Yeah. So uh, this, right. So, so uh, that's how the live event uh, has taken place. Uh, but uh, my point is that there are clear lines uh, between uh, what can be uh, done online and uh, what cannot be done uh, online. So there are some people's perspective uh, in the future. So uh, I, I think uh, that is uh, one of the you know, permanent change. Yeah. From your, uh, from your background, your specialist background, uh, Filiberto, how would you uh, see the, 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 the situation in, uh, in this domain of micro uh, commercial uh, marketing events? And what would be the question for Rieko from... Uh... Uh, the question is uh, specifically, you know, thinking about the food and beverage related experience. I'm interested in understanding in a context where, you know, in wines, in spirits, in beer, in food, a lot of brand building happens through small events, uh, which you try to amplify on social media. Uh, uh, this is a fairly, let's say, used and leveraged adoption model, uh, which uh, especially in the more premium segments and in the earlier segments, companies tend to avoid mass market uh, uh, TV advertising. So, uh, based on your experience, uh, what has changed uh, uh, on your experience, Fieco? Sorry, what has changed uh, uh, in the brand building of PR of events uh, on testing or making sure that there is a word of mouth uh, uh, for beverages, food, uh, premium beer, uh, premium wines, premium spirits. What have you seen happening? What do you think it's going to happen further in the future? I think, uh, Roberto, I think the basic uh, the concept and the basic theory of brand building hasn't been changed. Uh, whatever, uh, you know, some, some uh, the PR or the event or some, you know, mini something event uh, canceled or scaled down or partly goes to the online. Uh, but brand building is how to engage people, right? How to engage the consumer, right? And then how to capture uh, you, your brand space uh, in, the, in their mind, right? So technically, uh, the, uh, the, the skill, uh, pitching skill or presentation skill uh, may require some changes uh, when it comes to uh, hosting the online event. But basic understanding of how to engage people hasn't been changed. So you say that basically the adoption model is always the same. Uh, it's the delivery method, uh, which is uh, s switching from one to the other. Uh, what are the drawbacks of these uh, uh, online tastings, if we can call them this way? Well, uh, if technology advanced, uh, we may, you know, taste the, the, some sample uh, online, or we may smell. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, currently we are not able to do that, right? So, as you uh, rightly mentioned, there are some drawbacks, uh, which is to introduce the the new food or new new sample of uh, innovative products uh, when it comes to the beverage or wine or beer or or any kind of food uh, to the consumer uh, to create some new category, that kind of activity experience some, some kind of drawback, okay. unfortunately. Follow up question, because uh, uh, we have seen in Europe and in North America, because of this impossibility of deliver this approach, 
uh, a lot of brands have tried to develop uh, direct to consumers. So from food delivery or from the food producer and beverage to producer directly to the consumer at home. Of course, not only product, but brand experiences, uh, which is far more complex. It's easy to deliver product. <laughs> Building a, you know, a digital experience is way more complex. Uh, have you seen in Asia something similar? Uh, why, why not? And what do you think about it? Uh, right. So uh, some tries uh, to present their uh, the new products or new menu uh, through the online delivery model. So take the Singapore airline, for example, uh, the part of uh, the, the, you know, uh, to, to uh, ramp up uh, their business. Uh, the Singapore era introduced uh, the home delivery for the business class menu or first class menu. So this is not, uh, you know, produced by the, the, the food company or, you know, brand owner of the, the, the beverage or the, the food, uh, but Singapore airline uh, try to engage uh, with their brand uh, that, the, the culinary service is a part of the, the experience of the airline, right? So they, they try to engage with the consumer uh, to introduce uh, their uh, state of the art, uh, the, the fast class menu uh, with some champagne or wine. Or, and, and then uh, they also have how to cook, kind of how, how to warm, how to cook the, the textbook. And not that it's not that exactly textbook, but yeah. Some kind of the uh, the manual attached to that the very nice. fancy the, the food box. Wow, that's a great example. Thank you, Marco. Uh, uh, actually, I have a little uh, little detour, uh, just a curiosity because uh, I I learned that uh, your uh, founder at POC, Mr. Tanida San, if I'm uh, if I'm correct. Uh, mm -hmm. He actually was uh, the inventor of the uh, vending machines. Uh, he was. See. So it's quite exceptional as an achievement uh, because uh, his uh, intuition to start the company uh, as uh, uh, Nick Lemon was uh, the, the mixing of the gin feeds after mm -hmm. the war for the, the price of the lemon to make it uh, accessible. So he actually started as a barman or as an owner of a bar, uh, more correctly. Uh, but then in the early 1970s, he invented the vending machines that are everywhere in Japan. And um, um, well, uh, he, what he invented uh, is not the vending machine itself, but he invented the, the, you know, the cold and the hot, yes. you know, to the temperature. Yeah. Yes, the, 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 yes, he had the insight uh, right. uh, while he was parking uh, at the side of the road uh, and saw all the truck drivers drinking cold uh, drinks. But uh, do you think there will be changes accelerated by COVID in the distribution of uh, drinks uh, like uh, the vending machine and the hot cold has been a huge uh, revolution in terms of distribution? Would you, would you anticipate any technology for delivery, robots, uh, drones, uh, any new ways uh, to, to, uh, to bring uh, the product to, to the consumer physically? Uh, yes, I would. I would anticipate that uh, some kind of the drone delivery uh, can be the future model of how to deliver the product to the consumer uh, because there are the manpower shortage for the delivery guys, right? Yeah. Uh, after the border closure, uh, because of the fact that I'm living in Singapore, yeah. Uh, but many, uh, you know, the driver, logistic driver, uh, comes from the Malaysia, the commuting yeah. from Malaysia every day. Uh, but after uh, last March, uh, suddenly the border the cross shut down, yeah. and then still uh, the border is not open. So we are uh, experiencing some kind of the manpower shortage. So in the future, I, I also think that uh, more technology, uh, technological advancement uh, taking place, putting place in a delivery space. Thank you. We took a detour from the topic of um, uh, from the topic of business events to honor uh, 
the, the memory of your founder and the, 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 the genius of the, the founder of uh, POCA. I would like to go back uh, to uh, business events, uh, but I stay on uh, uh, inspirational uh, genius uh, because uh, I would like to ask you, uh, and on talent also, I would like to ask you two questions that are actually two sides of the same coin. On the one hand, uh, uh, we have the example of uh, networking for thought leadership, and we met in Moscow and in Beijing on conferences uh, where you were invited already a few years ago as a uh, thought leader for, uh, for uh, the, the Japanese, in that case, uh, luxury market. So these kind of events like uh, the uh, the World Economic Forum, uh, like uh, the, the, the major events uh, that happen uh, normally, um, they are uh, dealt with online. They are, uh, they are dealt with uh, as uh, connection as we are doing now, uh, and the leaders don't have informal space to uh, mm -hmm. connect to each other. Uh, at the same time, the talent development uh, events in companies, workshops, uh, seminars, uh, uh, are also transferred online. So basically, you have thought leaders at the level of uh, presidents uh, or uh, big industrialists or uh, CEOs like you, uh, who used to fly to Davos uh, or to, to meet in London or to meet uh, as we did in Moscow or Beijing and spend a couple of days in a sort of retreat, who tend to be more and more confined to, uh, to Zoom or to Teams. And then you have the, the young talent in companies that is also forced into these uh, uh, online uh, rituals. Uh, do you see parallels? Do you see divergences between these two classes of uh, business events? that seem very distant, but basically it's about bringing uh, talent and bringing vision and inspiring people uh, by getting them together. And now they are uh, not possible in presence. Um, I think the way uh, to look at it uh, is from the, uh, the angle of the purpose. So if the purpose of event uh, is uh, networking, uh, which requires a physical interaction or physical chit chat uh, is imperative part of that event. Uh, they will stick to the uh, live event, although uh, they are forced to the scale down. So take the World Economic Forum example uh, that they they will scale down, but the Singapore uh, instead of the Davos uh, ho will host the World Economic Forum because uh, they see the you know imperative part of this. Uh, World Economic Forum is not just presenting their view, but also the networking. Uh, however, if the uh, talent developing the event, uh, such as workshop or uh, the, the online the forum uh, to train uh, themselves, then the purpose is there, right? So it's not the you know, purpose of the, uh, the chit-chatting or uh, the networking. So they can be done uh, on the online platform. Uh, mm, yes, thank you. Well, the, the, I like uh, the, the way you define uh, networking as chit chatting because <laughs> I have always been a, a very strong advocate of uh, mm, appreciating uh, the informal interaction over coffee, over uh, lunch, over dinner, uh, which is normally regarded in Northern European culture uh, as a waste of time. And in Italian culture is the place where actually the, the real business happens. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I, yes, I agree, Marco. Uh, and also another point of view uh, for the, the business event, uh, especially the networking uh, is a part of the, the purpose. Uh, I think the serendipity uh, is also uh, the imperative part of the, the networking or chit chatting, right? Yeah. So, uh, I'm not talking about the, the formal event, but uh, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, the, the, there is a Silicon Valley, uh, there is yeah. a serendipity uh, that the uh, entrepreneur uh, came across the investor uh, to, to provide the elevator pitch or something. Yeah. Uh, this is, a, this is a, uh, the example of the, uh, the, the live event. 
or yes. socializing or networking. Yeah. And from the point of view of uh, corporate uh, leadership, uh, um, the, the, the introduction of, um, of uh, uh, online uh, uh, workshops, uh, talent management, uh, talent uh, growth uh, uh, events, uh, um, uh, we have observed even in academy with, uh, with students, we have observed uh, that uh, brings along uh, a problem of motivation, attention dropping, uh, even, you know, simply maybe if you uh, normally you would visit uh, maybe a factory or a subsidiary uh, in, uh, in Indonesia, uh, people would be energized by your, by your presence uh, live. But uh, um, did you take any uh, measures uh, to soften uh, the, the kind of a functional interaction that you have uh, uh, with online communication, because if you have a, a, a talent uh, a talent growth event uh, uh, online, people might be oriented to to perform and not so much to really uh, absorb and contribute to uh, to the vision. So, did you look at it from a different angle uh, as uh, as uh, as leadership challenge? Uh, right. So as a leader of the company, to mitigate the lack of the physical interaction to the employee, uh, because engaging the employee is also the part of my uh, important role. So uh, that uh, to mitigate this, I frequently, I try to frequently engage with the, uh, the, the employee, uh, especially in Malaysia, because they are uh, experiencing several lockdowns, uh, unlike Singapore. Singapore, we are quite okay, but the Malaysian employee, uh, they are experiencing very tough, uh, challenging times. So I try to frequently engaging with them, uh, even though via the Teams or Zoom call, uh, but just talking to them and then just listen to them uh, about their challenges and how they have been through uh, the particular uh, the moment. Uh, that is also, uh, um, my part of the my part of role, I think. Yeah. So you you invest more time and you invest more personal attention to balance uh, the, the the lack of presence uh, in physical uh, space. Uh, exactly, uh, because I think uh, during this pandemic, and then also uh, many company uh, try to uh, try to sustain their viable bottom line many leaders tend to uh, communicate with them uh, with the action driven and then uh, result oriented the way of uh, the communication, right? But if the leader uh, tend towards uh, too much action driven and the result oriented, employee might lose the sense of belonging. So I also, um, you know, I talk to myself that how I, you know, can communicate with my employee, my colleague, with the vision oriented, and also with empathy. Yeah. So that's my part of the uh, daily <laughs> exercise. Yeah. And I well, think it's the future of leadership. It's really based on, you know, having empathic leadership, uh, as you say, which also takes in consideration. Uh, uh, the wellness uh, of, of the employee, both at a physical and a mental uh, level. And yeah, exactly, Alberto. I think you know the technology helps to connect with people, but the end of the day, uh, it's a combination of the technology and humanity. So that's the core of any kind of the networking or communicating or socializing. I think. Well, actually, this is a perfect bridge to the next uh, point, because if you expand your time horizon into 10 years from now, and if you look at uh, technology and events, uh, uh, and here also Filiberto could, uh, could uh, comment because he has uh, done some experiments uh, last year with uh, uh, virtual reality and uh, immersive uh, events. But uh, uh, how do you see 10 years from now, 
uh, in an extreme scenario where uh, everything becomes uh, digital. Uh, how do you see the, the interplay of events and technologies? What uh, kind of technologies will uh, uh, support us? Uh, and wh what kind of events will uh, continue to, uh, to happen uh, and which uh, not? So uh, if, you, if you just think in a, in a sort of uh, decade from now, 2031, and then Filiberto, please, uh, uh, feel free to join with uh, your angle on uh, digital technologies. So, Filberto, or me? The echo first. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, so, Marco, uh, when think about in 10 years' time, uh, that certainly uh, much of the technological advancement put in place, uh, especially uh, how to complement the human physical interaction, uh, which is, uh, you know, virtual reality, the technology uh, will more and more sophisticated in the future. And also um, the how to, uh, we talked about a bit uh, before, uh, but how to duplicate the, you know, sampling or, you know, physical, the portion of the event uh, into uh, the virtual space. Uh, is also uh, one area uh, to look at. So I'm very, very looking forward to see how this kind of te technology will advance uh, in the future. So a kind of digital twin for a cup of tea. Uh, <laughs> Maybe. Uh, yeah. And Maybe. Filiberto, Filiberto uh, what do you think uh, could be an angle to, to build upon what uh, Rieko suggested? But the... From my perspective, uh, I still think that there is going to be a digital side. So in the sense that, uh, uh, as Rieko was mentioning earlier, there is the, this uh, emotional connect connecting tissues that one needs to build sometimes. And that requires being, uh, you know, at a bar <laughs> drinking or around the table eating or sharing stories of... Uh, whatever, uh, you know, or drinking tea, by the way. But actually, I, I would like to ask a lead, a, a, um, I would like to ask a, a question on, uh, on lead time and the structure from a macroeconomic and business uh, expertise viewpoint. Uh, and the question is the following. Uh, let's say in 10 years, we have the, the digital twin uh, of the cup of tea, yeah? Uh, the, the event industry that goes to match these, these new experiences uh, uh, might be very different from the event industry that you have now. Now you have an event industry that is very fragmented, lots of uh, small, medium, sometimes individual uh, enterprises, uh, lots of uh, um, freelance uh, contribution. Uh, the, the, in the digital sector, we have seen how uh, uh, startups went to uh, uh, leading and even uh, monopolistic positions in a matter of, uh, of 10 years. Uh, if you think about the world in 10 years, uh, Rieko, uh, what kind of uh, technology company and what kind of events company will, uh, will be fit for purpose in uh, in half a decade to deliver these technologies and to deliver these events? Will it be more a galaxy of small enterprises or do you, would you expect to have a consolidation? Do, would you expect, uh, as a CEO, would you expect to work with startups that uh, at this moment don't exist, but in five years will be very successful? Or would you expect to work uh, with uh, the, the big, uh, big tech uh, because they will be more and more successful. How do you see the, the, the business landscape around the technology and around event industry evolve? Sure, sure. Okay. So I think, Marco, uh, the way to look at the uh, in 10 years and the technological advancement and the cooperation relationship uh, is that uh, one way to look at that uh, is operation platform. So I think the basic concept of the interdependence of the cooperation and the vendor is pretty much the same as the Microsoft model. So 
who provide the operation system dominate the space, right? Because uh, when you think about digital event, digital uh, the conference, uh, the major difference uh, between uh, the physical event and the digital event is that uh, in digital event, everything can be recorded, right? Then uh, you can utilize this recording data as your data. We always, you know, who own the data program, uh, but aside from who own the data program, uh, that data analytics, uh, with data analytics, uh, you can utilize the, the event uh, more than one time event, right? So there is uh, one way to look at it, the, the operation that the perform. And then the other, uh, the vendor or other space would be the application. Mm -hmm. So here, the physical event, uh, many designer, architect, and uh, the consulting uh, to provide some kind of application to design booths or to curate uh, the, the event itself. Uh, but when it comes to the online event, this application provider uh, can be different from uh, that we have now uh, because uh, with the online or uh, the platform, we only see the screen. So the presentation skill set and then designing the skill set, the background or how to present your idea, uh, your product can be different. So mm. this kind of the presentation skill, uh, the, the provider uh, needs to require uh, another sophistication or another uh, technological advancement. And very quickly, I would say one thing that we need to take in consideration is the fact that uh, uh, traditionally events are built, uh, uh, you know, in cycles where everybody goes to one place for an X number of days uh, because that also maximizes the. Uh, um, simplifies the logistics and maximizes the economic impact for the city, for the country organize, organizing the event. But when we talk about digital events, we don't have that constraint any longer, which basically means that cities and touristic organizations are less likely to promote those events, and there is really no need to say, I'm going to do this event one week a year. It could be an all year around event with three, four, five key peak windows uh, across the 12 months. Well, the, the, so that's, that's, uh, that's something that I'm uh, you know, playing with. Uh, at this if, I'm, uh, if I'm correct, uh, Rieco, in this scenario and building uh, upon what, uh, what Filiberto described of a more distributed calendar, we could think of an event uh, industry and the uh, technology around the event industry organized by very large platforms uh, driven by data and data analysis. And uh, on these very large platforms, uh, uh, very vertical apps, uh, almost personal branding uh, or uh, stylist for the for the, the branding of the uh, of the the the, 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 the screens uh, or similar uh, similar construction. So on the one end, uh, a very consolidated uh, technological uh, platform side, and on the other end. Uh, uh, a completely uh, new side of uh, specialists uh, in all sorts of curation, uh, uh, art direction, and other uh, expertise that maybe don't exist uh, yet. We could have, uh, for example, a vocal coach uh, for clubhouse uh, uh, speaking uh, skills. So is this your, uh, your vision, Rieko? Do you see it as... Uh... Uh, yes. Uh, that's the way I see uh, in 10 years. So because of the fact that uh, the corporate event, the ultimate purpose of the corporate, corporate event is the marketing, right? So from the marketing point of view, the way you present your uh, the product, your idea can be different as you rightly mentioned. But the platform, uh, if we think about a fully digital platform, the platform organizer uh, can utilize the data. 
if you think about the, the United Nations uh, sustainability, uh, sustainable development goals, for example, or other references, how far would you see uh, sustainability becoming in, introduced uh, and included uh, in the event industry of the future uh, from your business perspective from as a corporate leader how much demanding would you be to the event industry of the future uh well uh when it comes to the big picture of the sustainability goal uh the event industry uh produced not so much carbon footprint compared to the other industry like you know the automobile industry right so event industry is a very uh, historically uh, provide a minimal impact to the uh, the carbon footprint. Uh, but if the event industry uh, goes to uh, host the event on an online platform or digital platform, uh, that is more uh, the the less of carbon print, uh, footprint uh, is produced. So in in that sense, I I would say the more digital event uh, can contribute the less carbon footprint. So that's a good synergy between digitalization and the, the requirement of uh, lowering the, uh, the, the environmental footprint. Right. Uh, if we associate uh, the event industry, the carbon footprint produced by event industry uh, is associated with the, uh, the people's mobility then yes. For example. Well, I still have two questions uh, where I would like, uh, I'm saving the best question for the last, actually. Uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the question, the, the last general question is about education, and then I have a more personal question for you. Uh, in, uh, in educational terms, uh, uh, do you see, uh, and also, uh, Filiberto, you come from, uh, from a, you both come from an MBA background. Uh, um, you have experienced the, the School of Creative Leadership in Amsterdam uh, in the past. Uh, where do you see education for the events of the future going? If you have any, if you have any idea, do you think uh, that the, a leader, a business leader in the event sector needs to have a special education or do you think a generalist education uh, from business schools will apply do you have any idea in, in the general trends related to to this sector? well generally speaking uh the any the leader uh in even industry uh might uh requires as uh you know more deeply uh the, the marketing skill more deeply, mm. especially uh, when it comes to the, in the future, uh, where the digital event and the, in the physical event uh, combine together, uh, mm. that uh, more understanding towards the digital marketing uh, in a big sense of the marketing uh, can be required that the uh, part of the qualification, I think. Yeah. Also, uh, the curation, the sense, so curation uh, is also the part of the one uh, because of the same background, the digital and the physical combined together. Also, uh, I think the psychology uh, space uh, is a one way uh, to look at uh, because um, because of the combination of the online event and the, uh, the physical event uh, requires uh, the deep understanding of the psychological behavior uh, from the audience or uh, from the presenter, uh, right? So I think the psychology is also uh, one of the, uh, the area uh, when it comes to the education uh, advancement in the future. Roberto, do you have any perspective on? No, I, I, I agree with Rieko. I mean, that, that's, that's the key, that's the core, and that's what it's, how it's moving forward. And actually, uh, Filiberto and I uh, uh, did uh, quite some work together also uh, on uh, various uh, areas like uh, leisure, like uh, the, the, the blurring of leisure and work. Uh, and uh, Filiberto worked a lot about uh, rituals. 
and that's the question that I would like to ask you as, as a last question because uh, uh, of your uh, personal background. Uh, of course, as a Japanese uh, citizen and uh, having had a Japanese education, you have an appreciation for the for uh, green tea that uh, uh, is uh, very special. Well, I have here a couple of books from my um, uh, from my uh, quite uh, dense uh, uh, bookshelf, and one is by Tani Tanizaki Sang, and it's uh, the shadow uh, the the shadow line, and it's about Japanese aesthetics and the the relevance of uh, rituals and of materials uh, in the Japanese perception of beauty. And then Okakura-san, and that's about the tea ceremony. Uh, so when we speak about events, we tend to speak about uh, um, transactions, uh, networking, uh, business purposes, uh, industries. But at the very core, uh, uh, events uh, are part of the human uh, uh, culture of anthropology, uh, almost, uh, as uh, uh, defining uh, our uh, sense of uh, rituals and sense of time and uh, a larger uh, meaning of life that is even spiritual. Um, would you mind to, to share uh, your... Uh, uh, impressions or your uh, feelings about uh, the, the tea ceremony and what uh, uh, what it means to you uh, as a person who has become and is going to even grow more as a, in, in a leadership position. Oh, thank you, Marco, uh, to bring out the tea ceremony thing uh, because a tea ceremony uh, is uh, the part of my life. Uh, it's my life work, I, I would say. So uh, if I uh, interpret the tea ceremony uh, into the event, the context, the tea ceremony is all about networking historically. So uh, small so tea house is a place of the negotiation, the place of the networking. But what difference uh, between the networking event and the tea ceremony is that networking is how you can express yourself, how you can present yourself. But in a tea ceremony, it's an unverbal communication. So with the deep mutual trust uh, on the base that they presume, they assume, they imagine what the host would like to bring out and the what guest would like to respond. So it's an art of the uh, unverbal communication, uh, but with the help of the, um, the art, like uh, the tapestry or a teacup or the tea bowl uh, that host using in uh, the, the particular tea ceremony, the guest can imagine that, that the host would like to say this is this and the guest would like to respond this is this. So this is the ultimate goal of the you know, spiritual the interaction <laughs> in a tea ceremony. What I find remarkable is that uh, with uh, with all your uh, corporate uh, leadership achievements and uh, academic titles, uh, you call the, the work of your life the tea ceremony. So yes. actually, that is the, the guiding path uh, where everything else is coming. And mm -hmm. uh, as an event, uh, uh, it, it is uh, very deeply rooted uh, in Japanese culture. And I think maybe that's a good uh, lesson for the event industry to stay rooted in the culture where, uh, uh, where uh, rituals and where events happen. And as an event, uh, uh, it is uh, um, at a higher level of communication. And that's also something that uh, perhaps in the educational sector should be uh, considered uh, besides marketing and psychology also to leave some space for a higher dimension of uh, communication of what we call uh, in, uh, in Europe, savoir faire, that uh, is, is a kind of uh, uh, expression of the culture, of the competence, uh, of the, the expertise. Um, well, I'm very happy that we touched upon uh, the, the tea ceremony because I really believe that this is uh, important and you confirmed actually your uh, 
passion uh, to, to practice it. Uh, I would like to ask Filiberto if you would like to make some closing remarks. Well, for me, the, this tea ceremony, it's a great example of uh, what the echo was telling uh, was saying at the very beginning, which is, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you need purpose, you need a vision, and you need that uh, uh, empathic connection at human level to make sure that we uh, uh, um, thrive rather than survive this increasingly more digital world. And I am all for digitalization. I am an engineer. I love, you know, this technology advancement, but they come at a cost and we need to be proactive in building, uh, you know, processes and support and psychological safe uh, uh, heavens uh, for employees, for people uh, to move forward uh, uh, in their careers and thrive, whether we're working at home or not. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Rieko, for uh, having this interview and for all this uh, wisdom you share with us. Uh, and thank you very much, Marco, for uh, uh, managing and moderating uh, uh, this project. Thank you so much. Uh, arigato gozaimasu. <laughs>